Oh hey, it's your neighbor, the Narsicast, and welcome to the third installment. The Narsicast is where we go through every Ghibli film on chronological order with discussion and analysis that is worthy of them. This episode will be about the movie My Neighbor Totoro. And with us today are my humble and beautiful co-hosts that you all are also already know from the first episode about Nausicaa. We have the exact returning lineup. We have with us Darkonius. Hello, I'm not very humble and I'm not very beautiful. Sorry. Oh, come on, don't be so down on yourself. Also with us, a uh, even more beautiful tentacle creature, very slimy hipster Cthulhu. Today I'm extra slimy because Totoro is probably my favorite Ghibli film, so I'm pretty excited to be on this cast. But yeah, I've also thought of nothing to say about myself in the intro yet again, so expect this ongoing theme. Ooh, and a very shiny, polished white surface that is Platon Skull. Hello, glad to be here. I'm looking forward to discussing a great film with some great people. And then there's someone whom I have nothing to, uh, nothing funny to say about, which is Ziff. Yeah, it's me. I'm ready to talk some Ghibli. Well, I hope you're ready for this one, because this is gonna be a good one. Totoro is really... Can we say it's like the one gateway into the Western world that Miyazaki has taken, put himself into the hearts of children, the heart of film critics alike, and really left an impact? I don't know. Yeah. I, th I think Spirited Away was like the big breakthrough. Uh like this it, to to the west but but definitely before that totoro uh, like became an international icon um but so i'm i'm not sure if i i think spirited away put miyasaki really in the global zeitgeist but totoro uh, kind of put ghibli as a whole like it gave them the their mascot yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Totoro is like a complete merch machine. So it's kind of like the iconography of Ghibli and recognizing that style of animation as this like high quality with all these films. And then, yeah, like um, with Miyazaki getting the Oscar for Spirited Away, that was clearly like the more recognizing his talents. I think well, actually yeah. him getting that Oscar is him already being accepted. Now they admitted that a Japanese guy is better than all these American filmmakers in animation. He was already a big deal at that point uh, in my yeah. estimation. I'm not sure if Totoro is the movie that did it, but it's sure one of the three I always pick as the three gateways, which is Princess Mononoke, Castle in the Sky, and Totoro. These are like the three Ghibli movies I would pick as the ones that made him a name and that made Ghibli a name because Takahata still isn't a name outside of Japan for some reason. But one thing is for certain, and that is that Totoro really put Miyazaki on the map for the Japanese cinema audiences. Of course, he had already quite the renown from his previous uh, like two features, but both of them were um, box office, not uh, well, not failures, but also not great. And funny enough, Totoro as well, even though like later when like uh, VHS and home uh, DVD sales like really exploded on it, it really started making back the money it was originally intended to have. It's very interesting to consider that in the um, historical context of the release of the film, the act they actually decided to air Totoro as part of a double feature screening with Grave of the Fireflies with the much more renowned at the time director Isao Takahata, whom we also already mentioned. It's also interesting that in, in, in the aftermath of these two films being released at the same time, it is... Miyazaki has kind of overshadowed him like in every way in, in terms of fame, right? Yeah, except for yeah, the yeah, movies definitely. at hand, because Grave of the Fireflies is like the most acclaimed movie since Citizen Kane, as far as I can tell. Yeah, but it's also like one of Takahata's like most famous movies ever, so... Yeah. Oh, but, but, but at the same time, it's a, like, like, yeah, at the same time, Grave of the Fireflies isn't like... I, I, I think you're really exaggerating with saying like it, it's that critically acclaimed because like people who have seen it and are interested in 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 the, those kinds of films all like of, of course like acclaim it uh, love it and want people to see it and talk about it but it's not like I don't think it's as widely talked about I mostly see it mentioned when like people talk about the most harrowing films or something like that not the greatest cinematic masterpieces. I mean, the fact that it's harrowing is for a lot of audiences already a sign that it's a great movie. 
I mean, I'm just biased because I don't really like the movie, so uh, we'll, we'll the get, amount we'll, of acclaim it gets is We'll get into that uh, in the next episode, wonders. hopefully. Uh, for, for now, it's uh, well, yeah, it's, in, it's interesting that it's uh, side by side with, with it as a, as a double feature, because like mostly you want double features to like be like on the same wavelength, but these two are like opposites. Can you just imagine like going there with your family, like seeing the movie posters and like, yeah, this Totoro movie, this looks kind of cute. And, oh yeah, this this also, uh, yeah, Grave of the Fireflies. Yeah, okay, let's go there. And then of course, Grave of the Fireflies plays first, and Wait, they play that first. Yes. What? Oh, I think damn. it makes sense to play Grave of the Fireflies first. I mean, it Totoro was, was like a very good that. cool down off that, especially suppose, considering yeah. everything that happens. Oh, I suppose, suppose you really need to pick me up after like Grave of the Fireflies, but still, like imagine parents getting in with their children, like watching like the 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 Miyazaki already has like made Cast in the Sky, which was of course like also directed at children. So here we have the expectation: okay, let's watch something that is uh, good for children. And of course, Grave of the Fireflies is devastating, harrowing, and like fucks you up really hard. But it's still like a movie about children and like yeah. children's experiences, so. It and would still be the, relevant to children, even if it's like very you know, childlike, I guess. I would never. I, I, I would yeah. not show Grave of the Fireflies to to my kids. It it, it would no. That that's I an eighteen plus. I I eighteen plus maybe I wouldn't even say because like the the exposure like to the realities of war can be something that is of course very hard to uh, stomach for children yeah. and really hard to explain to them like but i think it's also a very important experience to not be sheltered from that but what i would say is certainly not showing it to children who are in prime totoro age which is everything be between like the ages of being born and i don't know 12. yeah i don't know maybe it's a cultural thing because you can see even like even in just like any like shonen manga you'll find like like bizarrely fucked up subject matter like just worked in there and they just don't give a shit what kids read. Oh yeah, Gundam tour. Let's get Very some colonies. Yeah, let's drop some colonies full of people. We don't care. We are we aim the children supposedly, but who cares? We can uh, luckily anything. for us, uh, my neighbor Totoro is the exact opposite of all of that. It's one of the most home wholesome films ever. And uh yeah, it's it's definitely not Grave of the Fireflies, which we'll be discussing uh, at a later date. One thing we should say is that Fireflies was almost definitely the main project of the tour, between Totoro being the second movie we've shown and that Isao Takahata's Fireflies being the first one because he is the bigger name in Japan at this point. Miyazaki mm. did oh. two or three movies, none of them very successful. Takahata did half of the World Masterpiece Theater. He was at the peak of his popularity in the early 80s, shortly before he founded Ghibli. I mean, he was the biggest name in anime at that point. Aye, that he makes sense. The main, he's oh. the main director, the main draw here, as I see. And, like, and Grave of the Fireflies is more of like a prestige picture. Like, like it's it's big, important. Like Yes, very much Especially so. for uh, J Japan, like then. Yeah. While Totoro these. is the opposite once again. It's not... And that, that's fascinating. Totoro kind of was also a, considered a, very risky in a, in a, in a, as a financial risk, they thought. This is why the producers kind of tried to push for the double screening in order to like make sure that Totoro is seen and makes revenue. Yeah, that, that's, that's amazing. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, uh, like, like Disney uh, in the 90s, where uh, after Beauty and the Beast uh, like broke the... Uh, uh, the the barrier of getting nominated for best picture they uh, they really wanted to like have a big prestige film that would actually win and they thought that pocahontas was it meanwhile they had this side project going on called the lion king who like e every one of the lion king wanted to be in pocahontas because that was the big good one uh well, that's uh, th th it's it's sort of weird. L like yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's it's an it's an old saying in the film industry: no one knows anything. Yes, nobody. Ever like, knows I, anything. But I can definitely I can definitely understand why Totoro would seem like such a risk because it is a really unconventional film, which we'll get to. 
Yeah, but let's talk about its success. And its success and renown and its critical reception is great. Nothing nothing short of great. We have, like, uh, director Terry Gilliam listing it as his number one greatest animated film on a list for Time Out. We have a glowing Roger Ebert review of it that's giving it four out of four stars, which is, like, his best rating and we have Totoro voted as the highest ranking animated film on the uh, 2012 Sight and Sound Critics poll of all time greatest films it's the highest rated animated film well, this is like critically renowned one of the best animated films ever made and this is a really huge achievement considering how skeptical they were initially of it I mean you're forgetting the most important most important crowning achievement getting an 8.4 free on Mel <laughs> really think some directors only dream of yeah i mean most great directors never achieved that most <laughs> great anime directors they all had thousand plus ratings or rankings oh no nobody knows who covered Jiri is don't have any hopes but yeah Best both case. Both uh, Terry Gilliams and Roger Ebert which i mentioned like highlight very interesting features that the film really exhibits For example, Terry Gilliam goes into the fact that the film uh, realizes or recognizes that uh, real life does not consist of neat dramatic arcs, but instead, and it instead never exploits situations for cheap pathos and like undue narrative contrivance or like drama or whatever. Instead, it uses the animation to like for this children's film to inspire and to recreate imagination rather than just it instead of laying out the entire fantasy in front of you Totoro is like a lingering presence that is somewhere out there and is like just occasionally just so enigmatically appearing and doing things that it's like more just inspiring the creativity and the fantasy to think about Totoro rather than laying out a fantasy of Totoro that is comprehensive this is what something he really highlighted and I think about the structure we will get into a bit later but also Roger Ebert mentioned that um, the film is made for the world we should live in rather than the one we occupy currently this is also a very concise notion of this somatic motif of the film and um, he also highlights the absence of like cheap drama I want to call it because he says there are no fight scenes no villains no evil adults no fighting between the two kids no scary monsters And so on. It is just a world where if you meet a strange towering creature in the forest, you curl up on its tummy and have a nap. It's delightful. <laughs> I really oh. like this phrasing that he chose yeah. here. I mean, he's a bit off. There is indeed a conflict between the children and there is some drama at the end, which at least isn't cheap, but it is there. Yeah, but but it, but it's that. not it, it's not a central point. It's not the, it's not really even like a plot point because as I'll get it into later, this film basically has no plot. Uh, I, I think what he's talking about is like the the old cliches of like um, of like the, the the kids coming to conflict with each other over a misunderstanding and then yeah. going their separate ways and then they realize it was all a misunderstanding and they come back together at the nick of time to save the day together and stuff like that mm. you, you, you know how it goes and also another cliche he talks about is that uh, the, they avoid the cliches of the parents yeah. because as it usually goes in those movies they're like uh, parents who misinterpret a well-meaning action of the children and like uh, punish them unfairly for like well-meaning but not understanding them at all instead the father and Totoro is reasonable insightful tactful he accepts the stories of the strange creatures completely he trusts his girls he listens to the explanations has an open mind he's like really antithetical to like most f uh, tropey parental figures in, in kids movies from the west specifically exactly if, if if you told me that there was this western uh kids film uh about uh, these these people moving to a new house and uh the, the kids meet this uh charming mysterious creature you would think one of two things either uh the parents won't believe them and that would be a point of conflict or the parents aren't allowed to learn about it and that's the point of conflict But instead, it's just like, oh, my, my kids are having fun adventures in the forest. That's fun. W what's a Totoro? I'm, I, I want to know. I like it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a bit um, it's a bit even more subtle than that in the way that the dad not only like accepts their stories, but like clearly like encourages it at some points. Uh, or, like, yeah. 
he he like gives them ideas of like the crawlies in the house and gets them to go explore it and like gets their like imagination to like fill out the world that they've entered into and uh, and, and also the uh the uh, uh what's it called a uh, obachan uh, character the the nanny uh, who's yeah, she tells them about the dust mites and uh, exactly the, like the, 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 the way in spirits. The the, the, the way an uh, old grandma would like like t- tell you fun little fairy tales to to like seven year olds. It's it, it's great. It's nice. Like the, the the adults in this film are all really nice and and treat the kids with uh, w- with respect and uh, and like parental love it's it's great yeah i believe the movie actually takes a pretty strong stance in this regard instead of like most movies which would in in like this particular situation i think put the adult kind of perspective as the real perspective of the movie uh it it really like questions our kind of own perspective i think and um right right much, so like... so, so th- this gets into the whole I- is it all in their imagination I- is is this all yeah, I th- we're, I th- we're, we're seeing their play pretend and then alter alternatively there's the actual reality which the adults understand and they're like n- nodding understandingly like yeah we, we know what's actually going on instead th- it has this really r- really j- just m- magical the movie uh, doesn't really give an answer to that. Yeah, it doesn't and really I give think, an answer because who cares? It's it's I magic. The, yeah, the best conclusions to get from it is that it's kind of irrelevant, really. Like, whether it's real or fake, I mean, I think this is especially stunning when you go into the more philosophical aspects because... Um, Which we will. Which we will get to uh, yeah. later. Yeah. So, it kind of... It says like we as the adults don't have like all the answers ourselves so who are we to judge a children children's perspective on things i think that's kind of uh a very useful critique i suppose and, uh, and but we've has. we've gone a lot uh, already into like the how much uh my neighbor Toto differs from our the western uh like uh films especially kids yeah. films but but there's Great still point. like but, but but still as we've mentioned before Totoro and all of Miyazaki's work has been hugely influential and as at least like in the uh animation standpoint uh, on the west and uh, th- there's also a lot of western influence in this uh in this film oh, yeah right? oh yeah oh yeah um the most it is remarkable that we like first spend like a couple of minutes explaining how Western tropification has like uh, done this and that to children's movies, but I think the most direct connection to some Western work we can draw is Winnie the Pooh, actually, because what do we experience there the, other than that the boy Christopher Robin playing with himself and his toys like imagines a whole livelihood of creatures living in the forest and just reality and fiction and fantasy merges into one like coherent little cozy landscape which does not require any villains at least in the original incarnations of Winnie the Pooh and just really has a similarly um, harmonious attitude and this can we, we can very directly relate to Miyazaki's own uh, filmography because he and Takahara have been working on Panda Kopanda in the early 70s which is like a two-part little short movie series about a friendly panda bear and his panda child coming to live with a little girl in her house because she's alone. And, you know, this big panda bear, which is not only in concept similar to Winnie the Pooh being also a big bear, has Totoro's wide and uh, really, really wide grin. It is the exact grin that Totoro has, he has too. And to draw even more connections to make it even more obvious that there's this kind of uh, relationship. In the second short movie of Panda Copanda, there's a little tiger character which keeps jumping on its tail. You know, have you seen oh, that somewhere yeah. before? That was the little <laughs> tiger. That was adorable. Yeah. The three of them jumping around. The little panda, the girl, and the little tiger. The, the, there's a lot of jumping around with the Turturros as well. Yeah. 
I get a small also, and also while we're on it, like there's one more thing, like the cat bus smiling mischievously, uh, mischievously sitting on a tree branch and then disappearing like into thin air. Straight up uh, reference to the Cheshire Cat from Disney's Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, well, not the Tim Burton one. I not mean, the it's Tim still Burton Alice one. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, um, but. Yeah, but uh, and like the the Western influences go uh, actually beyond that. It's interesting because um, the Totoro f uh, figures they're not like uh, and a pre-existing uh, folk tale from from Japan that he interpreted. They're, they're an invention, and you and you can kind of tell because they're not really all that Japanese. There's a lot of Western cartoonishness to them. Um, like I, I notice you'll notice in a couple of scenes there will be these sound effects that are characteristic of like the you know Tom and Jerry or Looney Tunes, uh, Silly Symphonies, that kind of stuff. The the whole the the, the uh, quick bongo drums when uh, when they start running, uh, and, and like the, the the little boing when they when they jump around. Yeah, That's, that it's it's very Western uh, in that way. I think. That's true because um, also also uh, also Totoro at some point uh, just draws forth this spinning top like out of like the ether, you know that, that that's like a, a classic cartoon move. Just draw out something out of nowhere. Oh yeah, his little boom boom. I think that's what I guess called. the opposite of that would be something like Pompoko, where it's definitely very japanese inspired i think that would be kind of the opposite where yeah every creature is like uh definitely very rooted in like japanese culture and japanese uh uh religious tradition as well well yeah, actually in, i think that's in, in, an interesting in, in, comparison between yeah. takahata and miyazaki in general in the way that like takahata uses the uh the tanukis and also grave of the fireflies as like the roots of Japanese history that he wants to explore, but Miyazaki is always looking forward and like creating his own, like Japan. As like we can discuss later, that the film is kind of set in this non-existent, never war having Japan period of like the 40s or 50s, and it's got these mythical creatures that were never really part of Japan Japanese mythology, but still like fit into it. They're almost like a new uh, tradition that Miyazaki has created because. He's always like looking forward. He's always like got this perfect traditionalist idea in his own mind that he's created. It's like we're talking also in Norsica. It's like this newly forged society that seems traditional, but it is in the future. And there's these kind of shifted paradigms of what you would expect. And we'll, d we'll definitely get into, in, into themes of uh, traditionalism and uh, things like that. Um, and I, I still want to add that in an interview that I read uh, with Miyazaki in, in the book Starting Point, he actually mentioned explicitly that he wanted to make sure that, and this is the interesting parallel, he wanted to make sure that Totoro does not come off as like a simple tanuki or something. Uh, that's very specific. It's very specific, yeah. In, in the context of trying to like de uh, unlink Totoro from the uh, Shinto mythology. Yeah. That's I think that's that's very important as well if you really consider the context of the movie um because of course Shinto tradition was a really big focus of imperial Japan and mm -hmm. uh I think if if you made uh, Totoro a sort of uh very traditional Shinto-esque creature this movie would almost seem like a sort of imperial propaganda fascist film, if if you understand where I'm coming from. Because yeah, it, yeah, I understand. And we'll, it we'll, really we'll, would depict this kind of pure temporal Japanese, very distinctly tap Japanese traditional landscape of just this like very pure sort of Japanese, distinctly Japanese experience, which would I think not send the right message. So I thought yeah. that was very good. Yeah, we'll go into this, and yeah, I fully agree that Miyazaki is again taking like all the care in the world to really dissociate his like utopian ideas of what the past once contained, and trying to free them of the things that were that happened to them, that that made them, that ruined them in a sense for him. 
and he is trying to like yeah. yeah and this is actually something we can find mirrored in also in starting point there's a little like uh, original plan or proposition like the two page or three page document where Miyazaki like really outlines what do I want to do with this film why do I want to do this what is my purpose and he uh, explains his project plan for Totoro as a happy heartwarming film that will make the viewers fondly recall their childhood and um, implore and inspire children to go out and explore the thickets behind shrines and just present a lively and fresh Japan that is not full of reminiscence and nostalgia, but instead focuses on, and here we go, here we go, what we have forgotten, what we don't notice, what we are convinced that we have lost, and still believing that these things still exist. And it, it's, it's a beautiful sentiment. Yeah, I think he did a very good job because um, this is actually proven by its effect outside of Japan that it doesn't really just depict a distinctly Japanese experience or memory, but a very unique experience that's open and accessible to everyone. So, yeah, to I think that's also anyway. accurate. In um, we actually see this a lot portrayed in like the, uh, the almost just the background of the film. But if you pick it up, there's at least five or six uh, clear Shintoist and Buddhist like shrines or statues scattered throughout the film that are like all like neglected and like overrun with weeds but the movie never like laments on these things like this is a lost cultural history that we should reconnect with they're almost like now part of the japanese scenery and they're a thing for children to like run and play and have a new imagination in so he never tries to like reconnect to that old way but like has the totoro as like the new spiritual thing for children to have Definitely, but th there's there's also that one scene uh, at the at the bus stop where May goes to like uh, and finds this shrine in the in, in the dark in the rain, and she seems really scared of it, and and like go, goes back to Satsuki to uh, to to be like safe. So it's a uh, I don't know maybe that maybe it's not entirely uh, just simple landscape. Maybe there there actually is some. Something there, there. I don't, I don't know if I interpreted that scene as she was necessarily scared of it. It seemed like a, it did seem like a playful childhood thing. If she was just like poking her nose around what was there, and there just happened to be this little uh, neglected shrine. But uh, I guess you can read it that way. That like there might have been a, a mysterious element to it. I got the feeling that to these children, the shrines are just that they are just part of the everyday scenery, but they're not important at all. Like Shinto is not important to uh, this film or to Japan, actually. That's the message I get from it. Like, they pray to that one, but who cares, really, in the end? They are, they are praying to that one god whose shrine they are under in the rain, and it may is a little scared of that one uh, in, in the dark, in the rain, in that, in that forest. But it's just something no, that's there. I think that, first of all, I agree that is basically just something that is there and that it's kind of like the like spiritual approach to the surrounding world, to surrounding nature, which have completely assimilated these shrines to like pay respect to them even. Like praying at that little shrine led to, in movie logic, led to Kanta appearing and bringing over the umbrella, you know? There, there's a kind of like one-to-one -one relation. She went there, prayed to the shrine, paid respects, and boom, there you go, your karma. <laughs> so there is some relation to that uh, if you like have the, the good, respectful treating of nature, there will be people who will also treat you good and respectful, at least in a symbolic sense. Yeah, but it, like it's 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 kind of di it's it's kind of difficult uh, with this movie because there's not really a counter ex example of someone disrespecting nature and yeah. bad karma coming to them. Uh, it's 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 just uh, again a, a part of the whole, like a, a part of the whole vibe of the the place they are at, the the scenery, the people. It's all uh, it, it's all kind and respectful, uh, but that doesn't necessarily. I mean, I guess it means that uh, Miyazaki like associates this kind of landscape, uh, this kind of lifestyle, this these kinds of uh, symbols with that kind of behavior. But it doesn't necessarily mean that like shrines are speci specifically uh, made out to be powerful uh, entities. Yeah, yeah. I don't really think it's it's necessarily like 
something about karma. Like, if you treat oh, nature well, then you will be happy. And this it was and just that. me being flippant. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I mostly think that Miyazaki really wants to believe that being around such people and in such a landscape will make you more open and happy and friendly, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It is more like the other way around, which yeah. I think is very interesting. Nevertheless, the uh, the, uh, the the mission statement and the results, uh, they, they fit together really well. Uh, I, I think it's a testament not only to Miyazaki's uh, ability and diligence, but like to the entire... Uh, animation stuff because it's just such a su such a holistic film like all, all all the parts really fit together really well um but but you said it was a, a side project uh so 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 what what does that mean in terms of uh, uh staffing and uh, voice acting okay this movie i see it as a side project because takahata is the bigger director and because if i look at the staff there's only 11 key animators listed for this movie, which is not a lot if you know anything about the key animators on other movies. For example, for Nashika of the Valley of the Wind, they had 21 animators. And for Us in the Sky, they had 19. Of course, those are two-hour movies, so this one will need less because it's only like 86 minutes. But then uh, Grave of the Fireflies also has 18 animators, and it's... Another movie from 1988, Charles Counterattack, the Gundam movie, has over 60 key animators on it. So this Holy is really crap, a smaller like... scale project. They only have one animation director, Yoshiharu, Yoshiharu Sato, and of course they have Miyazaki, who will correct every single line in the thing. So they really have 13 animators on this film. Although I'm not even sure if one of the 11 listed key animators exists as a person. I can find nothing about them. This is their only credit at all. Don't know what's up there. But still, it's it's only 11 people. But if you look at the people, it's once again Yoshinori Kanada, the legend, Makiko Futaki, Katsuya Kondo, Masa Masaaki Endo, Shinji Otsuka, all the great names. Miyazaki got... He only got 11 animators, but he got the 11 best animators he could get from the studio while... Grave of the Fireflies got 20 animators, but those aren't really the animators you will know, although Hideaki Anno worked on that movie, and Yoshiji Kigami, who sadly died around two and a half weeks ago at the time of this recording, in the fire. Yeah, I guess the, the length of the movie is also a factor, right? Because if, if you're gonna go for like a big award-winning kind of mood, you, you you're usually thinking of like the two and a half hour movie the two hour movie but the, compared... the two hour animated movie is really long yeah yeah well, that's always that a lot might of be true actually i mean the longest animated movies are final yamato and that the what is it called the disappearance of harry suzumiya which are both just over two and a half hours animation has okay. shorter films and those are monuments in this genre and this medium. Really. Yeah, okay. I think I made a mistake there then. Um, I was more thinking along the lines of live action movies where I definitely two and yeah, a half the... hours is not like that weird. I mean, though... the, mon the monumental epic film is much more easier in the yeah. in live action, and it's also an older, an older type of film, like what's it called, The Ten Commandments. Is one of those famous films that's really like five long. hours or something. Yeah, and that's from the 1950s. It's just an older style that doesn't gel well with animation. So with animation, uh, two hours is long enough. Nevertheless, my neighbor Totoro isn't an epic. Let's uh, yeah, let's say that much. The but they they do they do definitely get a lot of really great work out of those. Uh, this is a very small animators. scale project by comparison to most other great anime films. And it's also a small scale in the plot itself that barely exists. I mean, we have one town and that's about it. Really, the small movie against the big movie of Takahata, which is a, isn't actually longer, doesn't have a much bigger scale, but monumental weight behind it. So it makes that movie much bigger. 
Okay, first let's highlight some of the animators because Yoshinori Kanada, who you sh who surely know already because I've talked about him every single time he came up in the last two episodes. I mean, he did a slightly, slightly memorable animation cut in this. The cat bus running sequence. It's mostly him. Him and Katsuya Kondo did all of that. Wow. And if you just, if you just look at it, there's a Sakugaboro of the Genga he did, which is falsely attributed to Katsuya Kondo, but it is Kanada. You can just see the work that went into that. I mean, really great what these people are doing and quite interesting how uh, compared to other Miyazaki films where there's a lot of action in this movie there's only like character acting and there's this naturalistic magic which isn't really action but it's still a lot of things going on quite different in that way I think he had picked his animators that way because Hideaki Anno who is known for his explosions, worked on Grave of the Fireflies and not on My Neighbor Totoro. Although he, the person himself, Hideaki Anno, is probably much closer to Miyazaki. Yeah, I did notice that, though, in the way that, like, Totoro, in, by Miyazaki standards, probably has, like, the least visually happening. Like, there's not a lot of crazy planes going anywhere, there's no action sequences, there's no any kind of uh, interesting moments like that. But it's just all the little things that the characters do. Every, like, tiny little movement of their hands and face are just so, like, has such attention to detail and give so much more character to it, especially in, like, the opening sequence of them exploring the house. You can, like, look at, like, every frame and see something about their personality coming through. But I do want to note that, just as the usual spotting of the little trivia bits, Miyazaki managed to get planes into this movie anyways, because Kanta is playing with a toy plane. Yay! Yeah, oh, I noticed that. Yeah. Gotta get that. Uh, no, but, but, but even aside for that, from that little uh, uh, detail, like the, the, the way he, uh, he once again returns to flight uh, as this motif, it's like, uh, as I understand it, it's, it's like... To him, and like in a lot of ways in reality, it's like the most magical thing is to just fly through the air because that's something that's just so beyond like human ability uh, that, that, that like just to be picked up by this giant Totoro fluffy bear and just fly with the wind uh, along the trees or, or, or to... Uh, or, or, or to like f fly along uh, in the in the cat bus, which I mean doesn't technically fly, but it, it might as well be a flight sequence. It's well, it's, it's such an essential Miyazaki motif. Has in common with flight in particular is that it kind of disregards all kinds of like human stratiations in the landscape, right? It, ah. You see it cutting like right across roads through the fields, and it's like. It's the like trees how, part for it. Yeah, how human transportation mostly takes place is you, you know you go along a road, you know you uh, you step in a bus that is arrives at a certain time or like space. It's like it's a sort of pure smooth space where everything is open and um, you can just choose which path to take on uh, basis of like where the wind goes, basically. You can Instead choose which path to take, despite there being no path. <laughs> you can yeah, just go there. <laughs> that, that's that's what I'm. And there there is a sort of freedom in that. It's also almost as if you like, kind of defy the sort of ratiations in the landscape we have made for ourselves for us to move along. Um, it's uh, no. almost sort of revolutionary, I suppose. Yes, it's it's, it's in, the, in the, the same way that like a, a plane has the freedom to just fly over wherever. There's this track in the soundtrack called The Path of the Wind, which is very topical here. Basically that concept. I think that's really interesting. And really Miyazaki just wants to be flown to the moon. He just wants to play among the stars. Okay, now <laughs> that's out of the way. Yeah, and that's Very also cool. something you. that philosophers have actually as discovered as a sort of um, 
specifically referencing the losing Guattari here as a sort of way to free ourselves from our current uh, sort of oppressive society as well. So it's funny that kind of Miyazaki fi fi comes to like a similar answer. Yeah, to specifically create, through a repeated use of flight, I would say. Yeah. This is not just specific to Totoro, but like in general, whenever we associate flying with freedom. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all about like our relation to the structures around us, both literal and, and figurative. You know, I'm looking through a couple of production materials right now. And there's this page, which has a section called Meino Panzu, which is like my favorite thing, because of course they paid a lot of attention to having the uh, little panties show up. Because it's Miyazaki, oh, yeah. that's the only thing he needs to look out for. Because the rule has been established, if it's a Takahata film, you'll see the main character naked once, who is a little girl, and with Miyazaki you will just see their panties all the time. Uh, sure. <laughs> but it's actually true if you start paying attention to it you'll realize it actually works yeah i love that kind of detail that goes yeah. through everything it's always there and yeah, it's like a death and taxes with miyazaki it's planes and panties you're always going to <laughs> yes <laughs> well and that's why ishida is actually the next miyazaki because all of his things are full of panty shots you, only well, you, you know I, I, I think i think part of it is that a lot of this movie and uh, other movies like uh, Kiki's Delivery Service is that they, they, they we experience it at, at child height yeah so as, 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 an, as an adult you don't look under little girl's skirts like first of all because you're not a creep second of all because like like you, you're towering over them like you, you, you but like if if you're like eye height with them and 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 they just uh, bend down a bit, or, or, or the wind ruffles the the skirt. Like that, that's uh, I, I think that's part of it. But that's the most I've got to say about that. That I, I don't think it's the most fascinating thing about Miyazaki. I would just add just the little point that the kids are of course absolutely unsexualized. Therefore, no association with panties is ever in any sense like bringing with it like human sexual connotations of it. It's just instead how the the the. The consideration, the the awareness, or the care to be taken by the children to prevent that isn't present. It is just again to highlight: okay, these are like kids of that age. Yeah, Miyazaki is just a man child. He doesn't have to look out for that. That's what we are learning here. Well, I think uh, the father character, at least, is very significant in this movie because it's. Um, Especially in like a sort of traditional Japanese settings, it's very significant that you um, depict a sort of household without a sort of motherly figure that is usually associated with household labor and taking care of all this sort of stuff. Um, but then like turn around and depict somewhere where this presence is visibly absent and it's still... Uh, depicted as a sort of harmonious household situation, I think it's pretty, pretty significant. Yeah, Don't you uh, agree? I agree, I agree with that assessment. It's interesting because uh, May uh, May, of course, is too little to like really take responsibility, but it makes Satsuki really grow. She like can fill the role of like a caretaker and homemaker to a certain extent due to her like being able to like keep a brave face in front of May for most of the time and be like her inspiration and the person she clings to. And you know, this having a brave face in front of May also reminds me a bit of Grave of the Fireflies, but just just a smaller side. It's a, it's a really well characterized uh, pair of sisters. The, these two. They uh, first of all, I I think they have the exact like amount of developed personality that you would expect of someone their age which i i think is like um uh, i think may is like around four years old and uh, satsuki is like seven or eight does that make sense uh that sounds like about right maybe maybe 10 or yes, maybe 10, or nine. 10. Uh, may maybe 10 but uh and, and the thing you say that like yes it, it is definitely a very happy home but i i don't think it's as harmonious as it could be that is definitely an absence of uh, of the, yeah, the mother, which is especially apparent in uh, the days when the the 
father has to uh, go to work. He uh, works at a university, and uh, and Satsuki has to take. So he, she has to be a bit more patient, take a bit more responsibility. Uh, it's not necessarily because that's like just the way she naturally is. It's it's something she's uh, learned and developed yeah. from being that older sister in that situation, and it's not necessarily something she's like entirely uh, happy doing all the time. Like that's that's the point when she breaks down crying in front of the uh, the, the grandma characters be, because she's actually really sad and worried and she's got a lot to deal with uh, with with that mother being sick even mm. if like the the father is really kind and caring and her little sister yeah. is uh, is cute and well behaved most of the time it's 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 just a real girl with real family problems that a lot of people might experience and there's a funny anecdote that fits to this because she is a real good kid and there was actually a producer i forget yet uh, i forgot who it is now but he was talking to mezaki and he was like well i don't really believe those kids because they're too good kids they're much too much of a good kid and miyazaki was like angry he was replying like no i was that good kid i was that good <laughs> kid this is real yeah that's uh th th that definitely makes sense i, th I think like uh, And and it's also like yeah that they're, they're good kids but but like it, the whole movie is like it, it makes sense for them to be good within the context of the film they they're, they're yeah. good kids in the same way that the uh, the neighbors are good neighbors and this uh, and the same way that the, the, the like the school the school kids are, are good school kids like like it's 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 all part of the the movies. Uh, like vibe uh yeah because uh, going back to what you said about terry gilliam about how the movie doesn't have like these concise narrative ar arcs of like you know very neat neatly putting these emotions into boxes but yeah it does clearly have this whole underlying tension of the missing mother and how each one each member of the family does come to like coping with this in a way and so that like clearly we have um satsuki who like cuts her hair and attempts to assume, assume this like motherly role and um how may is kind of just struggling to like even comprehend it at a young age and i really think the the father character is the most interesting in this in the way that he really just tries to like be the best dad he can and almost like my reading of it is like totoro himself is like like the spiritual um side of the father like his stand like he's there to be <laughs> this um this like caring figure that gives these girls this world of imagination to a uh, not necessarily escape for, into because they never truly like escape the problem of their mother be not being there but they at least like can like have happiness with this new life where they've just been moved to a whole new house and they just have this whole new world to be in and they have to kind of like come and accept that and i think that's actually visually done in an in a maybe i'm reading too much into this but when we first see the uh, the literal white totoro first He's like a little transparent, like you can barely just see him. And then the more May focuses on him, the more v like visual he becomes, then he becomes solid. And then right at the end of the movie, where they've kind of like given the corn to the mum and they've like come a bit more to terms with it and they're like, they know they can be happy this way. We see the cat bus like slowly fade and like disappear almost, almost like the, not that they don't need it anymore, but like they have come to resolve with this new life. And that's like almost the arc in that's. And the tension it, it, of the it fades film being into resolved. and then later out of existence. I, I yeah, can kind of see yeah, that. Yeah, it fades out. I'm not sure if I agree with the idea of uh, the, the Totoro being like s something that adds joy t to uh, to their lives in, in a way that they couldn't otherwise. Because like y you see the start of the movie, like they, they've got like loads of playfulness and uh, and joy just just going around the house i, I, I mean th i think there's there's enough joy and playfulness to go around at that so what you have to consider is that also the house the house is already like in 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 instilled with haunted and cursed and uh, supernatural energy there's the soot sprites around there's the idea that it's like haunted is very early on present and it is already a stressful situation where they cope with like a rundown house by imagining it to be like magical like this where these soot sprites are almost like outside of the frame of what you are able to see where, where they are suggesting that there's a larger spiritual world out there that is somewhat interacting and present within this 
this realm. And Miyazaki himself as a kid had a lot of experiences of like changing area of moving. And he himself recalls it as rather traumatic. So that he like shows like kids being extremely optimistic and extremely curious and imaginative here, I think fits really well. And I think I agree with like Cthulhu's reading of Totoro as some sort of um agent that represents this attitude but not necessarily like the stand of the father <laughs> but <laughs> this must instead, be the work of a friendly stand <laughs> yeah <laughs> instead kind of like an incarnation of this uh, attitude towards the nature but as well to the like supernatural that is exists just outside of our spaces outside of our frame of reference where the totoro is not really comprehensible he's not like a person who had like comprehensive thoughts and um, Miyazaki talked in one scene about the umbrella thing. He wanted at first to have Totoro return the umbrella and like a handful of acorns to thank them. But then Miyazaki realized, wait, if Totoro returns like the umbrella, that would humanize Totoro too much. He wanted to like Totoro not understand what the concept of landing is, but still like display thankfulness by giving like the acorns back. So he doesn't return the umbrella. He just takes it as a little fun device. And... Um, Otherwise, he stays like inhuman, incomprehensible, but well-meaning, like nature, like at least in this film's depiction of what nature is. And this also is mirrored in the fact that Totoro receiving the umbrella in that one very famous scene at the bus stop isn't that Totoro would be like scared of the rain or anything. He, did, it's, in fact, he seems to enjoy the rain. The 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 plop plop sounds of the like raindrops is what entertains him on his little leaf on his head. So the reaction that Totoro like takes the umbrella and is, is happy about the sound he's hearing and is jumping up to make more raindrops fall and hear him up plop plop is like Miyazaki's way of showing that uh, Totoro operates on these things in a completely different logic from humans and it's not really fully comprehensible to humans but he's really enjoying like the nature and the interaction so I think this is a really interesting measure taken to like dehumanize but make t uh, lovely despite that the the big fluffy Totoro. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Though, though, uh, to to slightly back up, my uh, my Totoro is the father's spirit in like a in like a weird imaginary sense. Um, there were scenes that in particular stand out to me, like the ones where they're like playing in the garden, waiting for the trees to grow, and then it, like they magically rise it up with Totoro, and the dad is like literally in the office right next to the garden, looking at them and kind of like watching over them as they play. And again, the the lines of reality are blurred, so it's like he obviously isn't seeing what they're seeing, but he's almost like sensing the imagination and the fun they're having, and we, it almost inspires him. There's a little like character animation moment where he like thinks to himself, and he goes back to his writing. He's almost inspired by their imagination. And then there's oh, also yeah. the, the the clear parallel between their dad. They're waiting for their dad to come home on the bus, and then they meet Totoro, and then you know Totoro gets on the cat bus and leaves off. And then the dad comes right into frame afterwards. It's almost like an exchanging of father figures right there on the screen. And okay, yeah, that's that's a good point. And while we're like on the dream sequence of like the trees growing, I just want to say, I think it's really cool how they react to it. Like they want the seeds to grow. They like put much hope and faith into it, and like like uh, play with it all day and have the dream at night. And in the next morning. There isn't like a gigantic tree like that which the Totoros conjured up, but instead the like seeds have just sprouted. And for them it's like, it doesn't matter if it's true or not, if it was dream or reality. This is a, this is the magic already. This works. Exactly, it is exactly. already it's, magic. Who cares like whether Totoro is real or not? Isn't it magical to to look at this movie? Isn't isn't it magical that there are trees this big? Isn't it magical that that girls can be this happy. It's it, it's that kind of, it's it's that sort of magic. Uh, not the not the sinister kind of fairy magic that uh, we get in uh, some of his other films. Yeah, one thing I wanted to touch on also real quick that maybe is a bit more um, different from the West we talked about, but is that I think it's very important. Something this movie does is that. The absence of the mother, how that is uh, depicted in the household, it's not really depicted as this absence of this sort of essential, uh, essentialist, essential part of the household, if, if you catch my drift. It's more of just like a pure lack of sort of labor that is there. It's not that the, the, the dad can't care for his kids enough. It's not that... Uh, there is some 
essential part of like the nuclear family that is missing it's really that is i mean yeah it's 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 also emotional labor that's missing but it's not like how do i put this it's not it, like it's not like the household is is absolutely incomplete without that piece yeah. it's just that that would uh, it, it would add something if if it was there, there. there is a significant amount of emotional labor and household neighbor labor missing from from this family you see that and that causes a lot of stress um and it's very important that this movie and it's a very nuanced sort of thing to do it's very hard to make it this nuanced as it is because you want to make it make sure that you don't go in essentialist notions of womanhood being essentially good to be mothers but you also don't want to make it so that the absence of the mother seems insignificant and i think the movie walks a really good line on that and i that and i think it's, it's 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 a line that's really important uh, in this movie is that yes there is like there are like kind of like there are problems yes the, the the mother is sick yes she's at the hospital she's not at home but it's okay like th- this family is going to be okay it's not like the engine driving the movie forward is like uh, the anxiety of n- not ha- having the mother it's it's just a thing a, a, a bit of reality like like it's it's just something that these kids live with uh it, it it's not a plot uh in in any traditional sense yeah there's a lot of nuance to it and um i think it might be a bit presumptuous for me to say this a bit psychoanalysisy but um i would draw parallels between like miyazaki's own life with this in which reading through some oh, yeah. starting point and other interviews he said how he basically was a very absent father to his two sons and how he um he like he was he was definitely definitely consumed by his work and basically shifted all of the parenting onto his wife who had to kind of give up her job as a as an artist to like raise their children and how his like art is almost like it's almost like what he was doing like so i think you could almost maybe read Todoro as him making up for it in a sense in which we have this father character with an, with an absentee mother and it's like his only way to express that i th- i think it's an interesting element but uh but you, you're right that you, we shouldn't like over interpret and try to understand yeah, the person i, I, I wouldn't the want to like say concrete that's what it's about but that's just an idea but, it, oh. but it's, it's definitely a valuable piece like like w- what might have inspired the, the, this type yes. of story there's actually also a different side to this also very interesting and related to miyazaki's own life because not only has miyazaki as a kid experienced the the stress of moving a lot but also his mother was like at least I think seven to eight years of like strong tuberculosis. She was thick, sick. She was bedridden. She was often in the hospital, and you know, here you go, a film about a mother being of the in indescribed uh, thickness in a hospital, which is hinted at by Miyazaki to be tuberculosis. In I believe in starting yeah. point, he does say like yeah. in his notes that it definitely was tuberculosis. Oh so, yeah, yeah, that's probably probably why. That the hospital is also where the air is better. He says as well. Yeah, and I think he said um, many of the places, many of the locations are like places where rather he's worked or places that actually were his childhood um, yeah. home. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that that really t- ties it into the... Uh, I, I, I think this is like Miyazaki's most Yashike work. Like uh, maybe Ponyo could uh, be, be a contestant, but... Uh, no, Ponyo but has for, much more for those who don't know, uh, yashike is uh, a, a Japanese word that, like, I think it literally means healing, and it's a sort of uh, healing story, genre. I think. Yeah, it's it's a genre of uh, f- a fiction, which um, w- which is all about like uh, and like ideal, calm, everyday life that you just lean back and experience uh, w- without essentially any like. Uh, conflict uh, of of any type. It's uh, it's it's a very essentially uh, Western genre which you find in a lot of anime, but especially like th- th- this film really fits into that because it it, it has all, it, it overholds all these criteria. It's about just uh, an everyday life. There's no uh, like clear uh, dramatic stakes. There's yeah. a lot of vignettes. There's a lot of uh, calmness and waiting and just 
being in a nice place. And also there's this element of, um, of uh, I think it was called pilgrimage, that, that a lot of uh, uh, Iyashike uh, and adjacent genres will have real life locations related to them. Where like well you can go like like the same same way that a lot of uh, cute girls doing cute things high school anime will have actual schools you can go to actual towns you can go to and visit uh, so that 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 really the, the fact that he drew directly from real life places that really adds to this uh, to this Yashike vibe. And to give it like a very somatic dimension as well, he drew like Kusulu said from places he remembers as a child and he like even thematically draws from them. Like how in Totoro everything is kind of infused with the supernatural magic surrounding the world and the nature. The big comfort tree where uh, he first, where not, where they first encounter uh, the, the big Totoro, where Mei first does it. This tree is a tree Miyazaki remembers as a child. And he says, well, I remembered it this big. When I went there, I noticed it isn't actually this big, but it doesn't matter because as a child, for me, it was this big. It doesn't matter. Isn't it magical? That's the, that, that's the stuff this uh, movie is made of. And, uh, I, I, I think this might be as good a time as any to get into like the narrative structure of the movie of, well... Lack okay, thereof. Let's do that quickly. It doesn't exist. Next topic. Yeah, it doesn't exist. That's the thing. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so let's imagine that um, I'm writing, uh, I'm pitching this uh, script to uh, to a movie studio, and I'm like, okay, this is going to be a kids movie. It's going to be mo one of the most amazing, revered uh, works. We're going to sell a ton of merchandise. Everyone's going to love it. Okay, so we spend the first 15 minutes or so of the movie. Uh, and and it's about these two girls who have just moved into this house and we spend it like carefully going through the house room by room and just establishing the geography like where's the kitchen where's the bath where are the stairs and then they spend a bit of time finding the stairs and then they go to the attic and there are these weird suit sprites and we establish all of this and then and hear me out here nothing really comes of it We don't. The, the, there's not like a big sequence in the house where it's important to know where everything is. It's not like Home Alone or anything. It, there's no payoff. It's just that. That's it. We, we've explored the house. That's uh, and that's good. That's something that Totoro does. That's so strange. It breaks all the traditional screenwriting rules, which is all about uh, all about uh, plot and uh, wants and needs. Uh, And uh, and economic storytelling, which is to say efficient storytelling, do, doing as much you can with uh, as little as possible. But um, when a lot of people, when they uh, think about non-narrative films, you think about like abstract uh, color work and avant-garde stuff, uh, or, or you try to think of like. Something like Richard Linklater's Before Trilogy, which is like not very traditional narrative, just people talking. But this, I think, Totoro is the perfect ex example of how to do non-narrative cinema. Because there's no real character arcs, there's no real plot, there's none of that stuff. Uh, there's, and every time we get a hint of it, it's immediately like subverted. So if we, if we sit here... And watch it after having grown up with narrative films. We, we sit here expecting a plot to come along. Like, the, the film starts with this long sequence of them being introduced to the house. And nothing dramatic is really happening. And then we learn they're going to visit their mom at the hospital. Oh, here comes the drama. And they go to the hospital. And she's fine. She's smiling. She ha they have a little uh, cute conversation. And it's okay. And then we go back, and then uh, May goes exploring, and she finds this this weird cave and this big monster, and it's fine. It's a nice monster. It's nice. It's a Totoro, and uh, and like the, at the very end, we we get like a, so a bit of heightened stakes. Oh no, the mother's been sick, become even sicker again, and oh no, May has disappeared. But they find her, and the mother, she's fine. 
she just had like a, a, a bit of a cold, she will be fine. It's, uh, it's, it really goes against everything we understand as, uh, as, as what movies do, especially movies with stories. And there's this uh, amazing article, which we'll definitely link in the description from Bright Wall, Dark Room. It's written by Lauren Wilford, which talks about how it, we might have to change our understanding of uh, children's cinema. Because we, we, we have all these expectations, like, like I said, when we go into this uh, with the way the plot should go, that there should be a plot. And, uh, and it gets like kind of weird. But kids, they don't have this conception in the first place. Kids love this movie. Like it, it, it it's they, they're transfixed by it. Uh, I mean, I'm transfixed by it because, because I'm. I mean, we're all ch- children at heart here. We, we're talking about Miyazaki movies, um, and, and what it, that might say is that these rules of plot structure and the satisfying arc and so on, they're not necessarily something universal. And fundamentally, a fundamental part of human psychology. It might actually be something learned over time. Uh, there, there are some uh, some of the early avant-garde uh, uh, cinema directors. Uh, they, they they believed that there wasn't really a predestined way cinema should go. Cinema, uh, as we understand it today, movies are storytelling machines. It's all about the tight narratives. But it didn't have to be that way. Like The first films were just these uh, uh, vignettes of things happening that you look at. Uh, the uh, Lumiere brothers uh, made like... Uh, the most iconic one is uh, the train arriving at a station. It's, it, it, it didn't have to like go in this great narrative direction and my neighbor Totoro might actually be like the best example of how non-narrative cinema can work um and uh, I, I think the thing the last and the biggest thing uh th- that i got from uh, from this article is uh, this really great observation that uh most uh, children's movies especially in the west like even the greatest pixar films are like really about a propulsive plot that doesn't like pause or stop. There's always something happening. Um, but Totoro isn't like a ride you put your kids on to keep them entertained for a couple hours. It's a place you go. It's a place where you can experience all yeah where you can experience all these emotions without like any big happenings. Yeah, sorry, if you don't mind me intersecting for a little bit. It's kind of like that rule of cinema that many people know of if you're going to show some something, make sure it's relevant. I really have a feeling that Miyazaki is trying to tell us, yeah, I'm showing you all this and it's all relevant in itself. It doesn't have to come into the, the story later. It's relevant because it is relevant to the kids. It's relevant to the characters. It is the surrounding space that is very relevant to this kind of place that I'm trying to communicate. It doesn't have to have a narrative sort of payoff or a plot significance in order for something to be relevant. Which yeah, is something exactly. I think that's, that's a great way of many putting it directors will presuppose that something being relevant has to be something an object having to be relevant to the very plot and narrative of the movie exactly that's and, ex- and that's actually a somatic element i'll explore a, a bit later <laughs> and, and that's exactly what, what i'm talking about especially uh, with the example of going through the house like in a traditional narrative like it, it would be a Chekhov's gun like later there's gonna be uh, a stealth sequence where they have to sneak around the house. So it's important we establish how the house is laid out. But no, it's not Im- important that way. It's important because it's important for the kids. They, they want to explore the house, and they do. And we are with them exploring the house. And, and kids watching will have this experience of exploring a new place. 
and uh, and that's what it's all about it's not like the 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 ride it's not the uh, the, the plot of oh let let's sneak by the bad guys who are after something no it's let's let's experience this emotion of curiosity and exploration and uh, but the, if i may and, interject and here really for a second special. Uh, I, will, I will say that probably where I am most critical of the film, I do feel like I well, I agree with a lot of what you said. I do feel like, yeah, that ending like 15 minutes where like May has disappeared and then they go looking for it is a bit too like out of place in the film in the way that like, yeah, it's a, it's a very immediately resolved tension, but it's still like a weird tension that I feel like doesn't mesh too much with this tone or these set of ideas. Where like we get May, she runs away. We don't know where she is, and like we we're not even shown where where she goes. We're just, she's just out of it, and then we see all the people panicking and worrying about her. We find the the slipper that might be hers lost, and then there's like this this dramatic build up, like in a normal narrative. And I feel like it it just does seem very awkward to me. Like I feel like this single bit could have been handled with a lot uh, with a lot more care, and that would have worked out better in general. And for me, it's just kind of a bit of a sore thumb in the film, though otherwise I definitely would well, agree. If I may comment on this, it is actually, um, this film is a lot of things that happen in life rather than uh, structured drama, and even just May's disappearance is something that happens in life, and Miyazaki actually draws upon a real-life event that happened in the time before uh, the movie came out. In, in the local area. I don't remember the exact specifics, but it was also like a little girl disappeared and an entire community like uh, got up, got into the dirty ass river and like searched for the girl. So uh, this scene is like directly mirrored in the movie where like the, the idea of community and the way in which like this tightly knit community reacts to such a like, let's say, more dramatic event is like reflected in the movie in a way that is very close to reality and not like very close to narrative structure. I, I think um, to, to 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 explain why I think the the sequence fits in into what the movie is going for. Um, well, how should I put this? The 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 way this movie works, the way it uses non-narrative cinema, is in a way um, it's narrative. It's it's drama as play. It's it, it's a movie. As playtime, uh, as as I mentioned before, uh, from a, um, from from the article, it's it's a place to go, and the thing about play is that you you get to experience a lot of stuff, but in a safe way. If you keep playing catch, you experience like the the, the fear and thrill of uh, being you're about to get caught, but the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to be touched, and that's it, and then you're it. Um, s s same same way with like how hide and seek might like uh, s simulate like s uh, stealth and and being afraid of being found, but but it's fine. You're just gonna be found. And uh, yeah, in I the same way, uh, my neighbor Totoro uh, gives you all these uh, dr dramatic emotions. You, you're you're like sort of s there's a scary attic, and and it's scary, but but it's okay. It's safe. The, there's the, there's a big uh, weird monster, but it's okay. It's safe. It's fluffy. Yeah. Uh, the, there's a, there's a mom who's got sick, and you feel sad, w which is not something you feel like during normal playtime. That's something Totoro gives. Um, yeah. But 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 yeah, it's yeah. safe. It's fine because she's gonna be okay, and the family's gonna be okay. And in the same way, the yeah, and in the same way, May disappears, and you're worried. Like you're really worried, and it actually like th that's the one point where it really amps it up. Um, but it's fine. She's gonna be fine. It's safe in that way. So, so it's like a safe way for kids to experience these emotions. You, you can be sad. You can be worried. But Mufasa isn't going to die. If that makes sense. The, uh, yeah, I I agree with you. And I also would add that it's not just these little fears and dramas and scare things. But like the entire movie is driven by well. How should I put it? Whims and drive. A very good example. I think the article you you referenced uh, mentioned this even. Like when we see May playing, she's like running around in the garden. Then she sees she sees a little pond with the tadpoles in it, and then she realizes, aha, tadpoles! I need a bucket. And then you find the bucket, but the Did bucket has a hole in it. Uh, yeah, tadpoles. Oh, yeah. Um, 
Um, and then she looks through the bucket, finds there's a hole in it, and then she has fun with the bucket, like, for a moment. Like, the entire movie is kind of this drive. Like, events that exist in, this, uh, in the environment are interacted with, are seen, lead to creative new, like, uh, ideas, to whims, to drives, to whatever is, is happening. And everything is bouncing off of each other, and it's very organic rather than uh, structured or, uh, like... To draw an analogy to what Ziff was explaining earlier about flying being a lot of, sort of a movement that defies stratification, there's no narrative stratification, no narrative direct line, but rather an organic interplay of all the movements that just happen. And, and this is not to, uh, and 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 it definitely is clear that Miyazaki isn't unable to make a good like tight narrative he, he does that that in a lot of his movies and he's definitely good at uh at giving the the uh viewer information in a really clear and economic way like like, like the amount of visual storytelling in in this uh film is so great like like you understand what's happening at all times and they don't even need that much dialogue to explain it and especially like may's uh, little exploration where she first meets uh, the totoros that's a great great that's a master class in visual storytelling so we've already talked about how in the film like the kids deal with the absent mother and with trauma so a lot of the uh thematic stuff i wanted to talk about in regards to totoro as a film about coping we already like uh, addressed but i want to like really fill out these gaps we left when we just previously addressed them and also like add to this like i love that you brought up iyashike because a healing narrative and a coping narrative which i'm like trying to propose here is like perfect mixture it goes hand in hand because in totoro the remarkable feature is that iyashike yes things happen like we we feel the ephemerality of life and so on and we like wallow in it we live it we feel it but in total, these issues are resolved through the naive and joyous possibility of transcendent that uh, transcendence that kids I see it everywhere in the world. How fantasy allows us as as viewers and also the kids to confront the reality through a filter of enchantment that that like kind of presents uh, or overcomes the darkness, you know, um, and. This is so perfect, and I already described the scene uh, that May and Satsuki, when they like arrive at the new house, like immediately start playing and start seeing the magical things everywhere. Like they literally magicify the dirt that is everywhere, the dust that is being like brought up when you like open the window to the attic and so on. Like that's magic to them because they make it magic. They want to live in that. It's like a textbook example of useful coping strategies. It's uh, quite amazing how this childish sense of wonderment in front of the world really allows us to um, deal with the world, to live fully in the world, because Miyazaki insists you need a sense of wonder to exist fully in the world, or to fully live and not just exist. Um, and uh, I, I think it's also like the the way it, the adult characters treat it is, is also like, like really great, because um, like we talked earlier, they're really good kids, but the the parents are really good too. They encourage this. They 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 make a. It, it's not like a, a chore they have to do uh, to open up the windows. It's it, it's a little exploration quest. It, it, it's a little game. And uh, later, when they um, when they find May after she fell asleep, and uh, they have to get back to the house, the, the the father's like, "Now let's race to the house." That, that, that's that's a really like that's good parenting right yeah there. and this is also um like psychiatrists have actually talked and identified about certain uh, therapeutic elements of 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 totoro in response to trauma like the characters what they do uh is that you provide a sense of safety calm and connectedness with others like sitting close in the bus stop and so on like you can even see satsuki quickly washing off hopping into the bus bus stop when the storm happens connectedness and then the father teaches them to laugh at that which is scaring them that is this is like as psychiatrists observe an active rather than passive behavior in response to trauma to be scared this active behavior like puts the agency back into the people to actually cope with to avoid with and to deal with this trauma and this is this is also really like good thing like uh in the way in which it like realistically approaches dealing with a stressful situation and so on and how the father really does a great job at inspiring the children to be active about it to be imaginative about it to be like happy and um an interesting 
part is um, that the father also approaches like a childlike mentality because of course like laughing out loud is kind of absurd but he's not like he does it because he knows it will help because it will help him help his kids and so on and in an interview Miyazaki in a, <laughs> like his typical fashion where he's like doing all his like very radical comments he said about May for example and her openness to uh Oh, embraced the supernatural he said she had not had her childhood violated by adult common sense <laughs> yeah that's uh th th that's a that's a great way of uh of putting it and i think it's i think it's a, th a through line of the movie is is the childhood purity and, and not in like the, the this uh not in a like perverse sense where like a, a adulthood is tainted but um but, but i think there's this sort of uh of uh, clarity of uh seeing the world uh, as as magical as it is um and i think it sort of uh and correct me if uh, if you think it's a bit of a stretch but i think he like connects childhood and spiritualism uh in a way uh and yes, and, yes. and that's that's a theme that goes again in, in a lot of uh, cultures and religions like in in christianity where uh, uh, like Jesus specifically says that the kids theirs uh, is the kingdom of heaven, and yeah. th th there's this idea that uh, the childhood and uh, and spiritualism is like uh, tied together, uh, yeah. and I, I think it's not a coincidence that it's just only the kids when they play, there's when when they're uh, in a playful mood or need to be in a playful mood, that's when they see these spirits. Yeah. There's also like a really remarkable scene that like embodies all of what you just said. And I'm going to quote like here from the book Miyazaki World by Susan Napier, which I frequently quoted of like last episode too. Um, the image of May lying on Totoro's stomach evokes peace and timelessness, an endless late spring day out of an idyllic childhood dream. The sense of sublimity and nurturing is heightened by a final high angle shot showing the forest cathedral like green roof extending protectively over the sleeping creatures far below. So this mixture of the spiritual of the sublime of the beautiful with this almost borderline religious but extremely harmonious and like uh, peaceful iconography this is like really the theme the, the the one scene that exemplifies like basically all of totoro in one scene i think it's uh, it's and it's it's just full of great scenes yeah. it's uh i think it's um one of the Cohen brothers once said that uh no no it's not the Cohen brothers but it's someone uh once uh Billy Wilder once said that uh, a a great film is three good scenes and no bad ones and Totoro is like all good scenes I mean every Miyazaki scene is a good must scene be his favorite because Miyazaki just makes scenes and then strings them together it's like <laughs> his entire approach oh and in the context of like this coping i think we can c like sum it up in a conclusion like the 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 that the, the magical resolution like the totoro helping by conjuring up the cat bus also again remarkable totoro is not humanized in that he like directly helps but he indirectly helps by providing the cat bus the means to get to the mother um the magical resolution to the real life trauma is like underlines the key message that uh, and i quote again the, the susan napier's miyazaki world that belief in the powers of nature and the imagination will give us the strength to go beyond ourselves and transcend the traumas of daily life yeah that, that's uh that's that's really well put this is this is a really good quote I, I i have to recommend this book again and again it's pretty new it's like 2018 released. It's really, really good. Every every single one of those uh, chapters about every movie that Miyazaki has ever directed is amazing. It is full of references to his like personal biography, full of his quotes of him, full of like an analysis and academic uh, uh, context. It's, it's it's amazing. Well, I th I think like uh, in um, in connection with the cobing uh, idea. Uh, I I think that's also like like part of the uh, psychology of uh, of coping of overcoming trauma is the environment you're in, right? Yes. This environment that they're in, uh, we've talked about before, is so idealized without being like specifically nostalgic. We talked about how it's almost um, 
non-historic. Like, like yes. it's it's as if uh, we're we're in Japan in like around the 30s, but there's no uh, fascism, no big nationalism, no war on the horizon. That's that's only just the the calm countryside. Yes, and in this it's context, funny. oh, um, it's funny too because. Um, it exists in a sort of space that cannot be real in any time because because the movie tries to depict the sublime it necessarily moves away from reality i don't know if if people understand what i'm saying oh yeah but, definitely um the more you kind of try to depict something that is purely aesthetically aesthetically in a pure place sort of this sublime aesthetic the further from reality you go because it is something that necessarily influences people in how they behave and what they want to achieve but that is necessarily not achievable in itself it's just a sort of nebulous idea that exists and above us somewhere really and really um continue right um and if you're gonna try to really uh, depict this sort of idea, you cannot really depict it in reality itself. It's it's a kind of funny f philosophical kind of uh, effect that happens uh, when you when you aesthetically move closer to a sort of sublime space, the more surreal and uh, less realistic it becomes necessarily. It, it, it becomes um, uh, it sort of. You have to move away from uh, from real history and real uh, and, and and like actual like like culture to uh, arrive at this uh, ideal place. Like like you you couldn't take a documentary crew and find a place that's this good that that's this wholesome. Yeah, this is uh, an interesting context here. An an early poster for the film, which has like a large po uh, picture of Totoro, uh, had originally the caption, this kind of strange creature doesn't live in Japan anymore, probably. But on seeing this, like, Miyazaki was outraged, and he was <laughs> insisting that it be changed to the phrase, this kind of strange creature is still living in Japan, probably. Like yeah, That's, that's he, a better vibe to go with. <laughs> he hints at the fact like there is something that has been lost was the original line because the original person that, that made the posters tagline believed it to be lost it to be gone but Miyazaki insists no we can probably still find it and this is tying into what he said about the film that he wanted to find something that is forgotten ignored or considered lost and he made neighbor to my neighbor Totoro in the firm belief that these things still exist, which is how it ties into um, what uh, uh, and I bring it bring him up again. The literary scholar uh, Darko Suvon calls a possible world's utopian narration, which is pretty self-explanatory in, in that it is depicting like utopian narratives that are possible alternative or possible imaginable worlds, in that they don't like. Um, and then that they take like elements that could have been different and imagines a possibility from them. And this is what we see in Totoro, which I'm going to be exemplifying, where it is pro projecting a, let's say, strange realm, what Ziff was also trying to get to, a strange realm of ahistoricity, where we have like Miyazaki's childhood world, uh, basically inspired by Miyazaki's childhood world, by his childhood worries, by his absent mother or ill mother, by like the landscape and the nature around his like childhood places, by the imagination of seeing the big camphor tree and so on. But it is removed from the context of Miyazaki's actual youth, which contained war from Japan's traumatic history, which was filled with grief and destruction after the war and uh, after imperial japan where shinto symbols are in this film taken from the imperial japanese context and revitalized in that we restore the spiritual connection they can make to children the ways in which they can help in which they can like exist in a world around the community and an interesting way in which this is done is uh through the idea of and this is uh um Give me a second. Okay, through the through the idea of like, no, let me retrace a couple of steps. I'll cut this. Um, 
this time setting, this timeless period piece, in a sense, is uh, conjuring like deep memories in a Japanese audience. And uh, the film seems to like embody, and I'm quoting from an, from an academic article now that was talking about this, written by uh, Philip E. Wagner, which I'm going to link. It is that um, it seems to be what Svetlana Boim describes as glocal restorative nostalgia, which she explains that as, at first glance, a longing for place, but actually a yearning for a different time, the time of our childhood. And she adds that the nostalgic person desires to obliterate history and turn it into private or collective mythology. But instead of like obliterating history, Miyazaki like uh presents idealized landscapes and visions of childhood innocence uh, as a res attempt to restore a better history on both a personal and a cultural level so aware of like what has been lost through the traumatic war history through the nationalist context that is like infusing and basically claiming shintoism uh aware of the modernization that happened after world war ii that like destroyed like natural spaces and like turned Jap japan from like a more spiritually inclined nature oriented culture into a very capitalist society which miyazaki also comments on that he really in a he comments on it in a 1989 interview and declares that he hates the Japanese economy and the Japanese people. Like he, he deliberately he said, <laughs> oh my God. surely there can be no more superficial people than the Japanese. They were not able to transcend the demon of rapid economic development. And as a result, we have the corruption of the world, the loss of ideals and the worship of material things. So he lets all this flow into his vision of what this forgotten utopia, the lost innocence and freshness of the world before it was kind of ruined and harmed, was, and uh, puts this in Totoro. But he still declares Totoro is not a nostalgia piece because he knows this is not an idealized past that ever existed. This is an idealized past that should have existed and could have existed, and he wants it to exist. Yeah, that, he wants, that, that's a yeah. really gr great way of like uh, putting it. Like, like if there's any... A uh, political thing in in Totoro, which like of course all works of art are political in some way, but like Totoro, like, like it definitely isn't as political as like let's stop weapons of mass destruction, Nausicaa, yes. Laputa, but it, but but still it, it's this uh, it's this re retaking of uh, national symbols, like like. Any uh, f fascist imperialist dictatorship l would love a lot of this imagery, actually. Like, of little children playing in the fields, of fresh vegetables fr made by the, the old grandma at the farm. And this is the glorious Nippon we're protecting. Uh, and, and of course, there's the whole uh, Shinto that goes like into a deep root of uh, culture within the nation. But it's not at all like ab about that it's not lamenting the loss of uh, of this glorious era or yes, anything yes, yes, it's yes. it's a non nostalgic almost anti uh, fascist or at least uh not with any trace of fascism conservatism yes and he he uh, is even taken out deliberately has taken out overt references to shinto that had appeared in original storyboards like he actually cut down on it after like he like saw the broad scope of it and like reduced them in the storyboards to really elicit this effect yeah i think it actually also goes a long way the other way in that it depicts a sort of communal living situation in this village that is kind of autonomous and um uh, where people are very have a lot of solidarity with each other and help them help each other out when they're in trouble because they basically can afford to and they have uh, the space to help each other and are not strained by a sort of very expanded capitalist economy and they're not like alienated in any way. There's no money in this movie. Not a single piece of money, not a single trace or reference to it. I mean, that doesn't have to mean much, but it's completely absent. Um, I mean, aside from, like, the father has to work. Uh, mm. which, like, but, but yeah, you're right. There's no exchange of uh, currency anywhere. 
And also, like, in the beginning, they arrive, like, in the back of a truck that kind of seems like, hey, someone has a truck and is helping me out, you know? But, but it's all, uh, it seems like oh, it's all exchanges of favors. Like, uh, yeah. like, like, like uh, uh, Kanta gi giving them the umbrella, them lending it to Totoro, and he, he gives them the, uh, the seeds. Uh, and the, the, the all, and the, the neighbors uh, being like, yeah, you can use our phone, and yeah, we, we can, uh, we can uh, take care of May while you're at school. And the school being like, yeah, okay, May can, uh, c c can be here just for today. And it's, it, and, it's, it's yeah. filled with... It, it, it's this type of, yeah, uh, tr traditionalism uh, that, that's uh, I really... I would say it's, it's a celebration of communal solidarity in a way that um yeah and there's actually a lot to this also in like real life because the movie has inspired like a real life forest revitalization project in the area of like miyazaki's home former home in tokurazawa um where there's a project called totoro's forest where like enthusiastic supporters came and like planted and took care of the forest and like made it like made the forest great again and um miyazaki was really proud of this where he like saw people in solidarity like voluntarily working building up a forest like as a community recreating the forest and he like characteristically commented that he appreciates the people because they were not ecology fascists <laughs> wow the, uh, i mean Mi miyazaki is great he, like quotes yeah. from him are always entertaining yeah. yeah anime was a mistake yeah I know this one is. I only fake. believe Don't this is uh, an affront to life itself. I think he said that about yeah, some I... 3D animation. <laughs> I think this. Um, I think this. Uh, what should we call it? Not yearning for a time that was, but like a time that could or should have been. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that goes again in uh, uh, many of his uh, his works, but I, I especially think. Uh, we're going to be talking about it in uh, Porco Rosso, which is specifically about like the, uh, the 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 contest between the time that will be and the time that should have uh, have been. And yeah, and, and there's and, also and like course, an interesting development between like the very optimistic utopian slant of Totoro and the more cynical uh, perspective that Porco Rosso has, but still like an optimistic ending. But of course, it it, it has a cynical. Uh, base point because I, I, with like the the quote i gave of like the japanese bubble that was of course before like the bubble popped and so on and miyazaki has gone quite a bit more cynical in the time after that uh that that, that would make sense but but i think it uh, all of that also comes to a head in uh the wind rises um yeah. which which i th i think really uh deals with this um this tension between uh N nostalgia uh for for a time that can't or should have mm. been and and like living in the actual world as it is and and yeah. how you how how you do that but until that time until the bubble bursts and until uh, uh un until miyazaki's uh, what should have been his final film i mean we st we will always have a uh, totoro uh in in a time where he just wanted to like give joy and inspire kids to go exploring and he he, he did it uh, by tapping into this this pure hearted love of just the communal uh, the, the japanese landscape as it should be uh should be thought of uh, yeah. how it could have been oh. beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, so another interesting way in which the film like uh, really comments on and relates to this uh, absent history, this non-present history, is in the way that the movie doesn't have what uh, the Japanese literary theorist uh, Kojin Karatani would call landscape. That sounds very confusing because, of course, the film is full of nature, of landscapes as we understand them. But in um, Japanese literature, as, as Karatani describes in Origins of Modern Japanese Literature, is that um, landscape is rather like an objectified nature. Nature as something to be used, like an epistemological like uh, knowledge-forming philosophical constellation 
uh, where as soon as we oppress nature into functional like things, we make them landscape instead of just having it be a subject, like something living, breathing, interacting. So this movie has landscape as a subject rather than as an object because like the um for example the majestic comfort tree he it plays like the role as as as, as both like kami ancestors like the root of a community a place of safety a place of mystery and wonder and it's uh interesting to think about this the nature of this community this uh film is based in is like extremely organically grown together all the pieces of nature like form a cycle form like an interaction and um this is also what the father remarks on that this tree is very old from a time when trees and people got along that the d yeah that 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 really hammers home that there is like some subjectivity to this tree that interaction with humans they like relate they communicated to a sense even and um the region in which totoro pl takes place is known as uh, the satoyama forest and it is like one of the most um complex like uh in lands uh areas in terms of like how the the uh, ecological system relates to each other you have like the mosaic fields of mixed forest rice paddy fields dry rice fields grasslands streams ponds reservoirs and so on and each each single habitat there is considered essential for like the 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 functioning of this ecosystem and um this there, there, couldn't po there couldn't possibly be anything symbolic in that could there yeah <laughs> this sense of like the total integration blurs like the lines between nature and culture because this is an area where like human the cultivation of the land has been completely assimilated into nature where it is necessary and part of like the the, the ecosystem stability and interaction and life there so we have here um something that will also happen in only yesterday when we learn about all ec like uh, ecological farming and all that all the nature around us is actually human made and is a new ecosystem formed on the basis of being made by humans but this is also um as opposed to like uh, back to karantani what as opposed to like landscape which he remarks is like a like a um, literary traditions that appeared after like the Meiji era, like the age of rationalization and the imperialization and all this like structurization by the empire and so on, that in literature before that, landscape wasn't objectified, but in literature afterwards it was. So in Totoro we see a re-emergence of a subjectified nature, in Totoro not only but also in other Miyazaki work. And this is very interesting, like as it as we see as it relates to Totoro. And here we again have like the direct tie to the imperial Japanese history that we even through literary style eradicate in the way in which nature itself is depicted not as object but as subject. And this is where I want to go into like Grave of the Fireflies, because this is the flip side of the coin. Earlier, I think before the cast, we talked a little bit about the fact that you guys thought that in Grave of the Fireflies, like the landscapes could have been like very easily similar to Totoro's landscape. Dark was disagreeing with that. And I think I was also like disagreeing to that with, to some extent, because here's the difference. While in Totoro, nature is where you go to experience calm, comfort, surprise, joy, curiosity, and so on and so on. In in, in, in Grave of the Fireflies, you have the opposite effect. The nature is cold and uncaring. It is object. It is, we try to live there, but it will not nurture us. It will not help us. It will not keep us safe, you know. It will, it is, in its, like, disillusionment with, like, the Imperial Japanese, like, uh, um, past, and the disillusionment and alienation that it caused in the way in which nature is perceived like providing no comfort and is very bleak and realistic in that extent. No, no trace of the magical realism and the sense of community that Totoro's depiction of, uh, depiction of nature enables. How, how would you define it being object though? Because I feel I, that... I think his definition of uh, the, the object and subject is uh, the forests and the... the, the the natural world in Totoro has like a sense of agency, a sense of relationship uh, yes. to the characters. In the uh, in Grave of the Fireflies, the, they're like object in that they're they're uh, it's static, and uh, and the characters are merely like in it. Okay, okay, in that sense, because I was kind of looking at this perspective of. Um 
uh, of of nature being incorporated in a sort of human perspective or ideology and i actually think it's kind of the opposite for that perspective because in totoro it really um depicts nature as this sort of uh, very human healing having this very human healing effect and being very yeah, a subject uh, you know yeah being very yeah having a sort of even a sort of solidarity with humans um, well, i don't necessarily think so i think they have a solidarity with the children and the baby. and again it ties into this earlier point about uh, the spiritual purity of childhood and and, and play so um but 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 you're definitely right that like uh, a a big part of this movie is the way that nature has this personality that you that is not in, not exactly human as mentioned earlier like totoro is really ha has a not not really a lot of human logic to him but still like uh, it, it has a way of interacting uh, with us I think it's interesting that in Totoro, like Shinto religion is not like, as we talked about, an articulated system of beliefs, let alone like the nationalist ideology that has been in Imperial Japan, but rather just a sign that the objectification of landscape is absent. Instead, that we have this relation to the subject nature still intact. So to uh, come back to the like uh, Suvan's idea of possible worlds, the what if question of the genre that is being proposed here is what if the Meiji Revolution never happened? What if World War II Japan has never been caused? What if this age of like stratification of objectifying the, the world and instrumentalizing uh, Shinto and destroying community never happened? And I think this is like the very strong point where it intersects with Grave of the Fireflies depiction of very crudely and directly and brutally honestly what did happen instead where um, you have an interesting parallel that, like, Seta, uh, the, the young protagonist, lies and is telling her that their mother is buried under a giant comfort tree. I think his name was Kanta. No, Seta. Kanta is What's the Seta? one in Totoro. I'm talking about Fireflies. In oh, Fireflies, right, the protagonist, Seta, lies to his little sister. Who, like, the mother died, yeah. Um, and he lies to her that her mother is buried under a giant comfort tree. Think about the relation to Totoro. This blew me away. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really, I'm sure we'll get like into the the, the weeds of uh, how Grave of the Firefly specifically yes. relates to this kind of thing. I'll pick this up episode. in Grave of the Fireflies next episode. Definitely, I still have some notes. I'll do them then. So I have still like after we've done sort of this heavy thematic stuff, I want to bring up like the most little, the popular little dumb internet theory about Totoro. Just, you know, I think it's amusing. I think it's amusing, especially since Ghibli has re Ghibli have reacted to it. It is the theory, and you've probably heard about it, that Totoro is a Shinigami, a death god, and that Mei is actually dead. <laughs> yeah, I, because, I remember yeah. reading about it, like, be, yeah. something about, like, the, the, there were, like, two kids, and one of them died, and it was in May of that oh, year yeah, or something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the famous murder case called the Sayama incident is what it is, because Neighbor Totoro takes place in Sayama Hills, uh, where two sisters turn up dead, and that start, like that they saw, apparently, according to the story, a cat apparition before committing suicide. But uh, it's an urban legend. This didn't happen, just for the context. So uh, the theory goes that uh, the persons that can see Totoro are actually close to death or already dead, and May goes missing, and the sandal is found in the pond, which means that May actually drowned. And when Satsuki is asked about the sandal, she cannot face the truth, and she lies about May's sandal. So she goes on a desperate search for Totoro, calling him, and actually opens up the door to the realm of the dead. And then with Totoro's help, she finds the dead sister. You know what that means. She doesn't return. All right, There's so, no shadow in the final scene. So I, fi I find this type of, uh, well, not exactly interpretation, but like more of a like, fan theory thing. To, uh, uh, like it, it, it almost offends me. Because, <laughs> yes. be because it, it's, it's part of this idea that for any work to be serious, to be taken seriously, it has to be dark and about deaths and comas and serious stuff you know not this uh not this non-serious kids having fun and yes. like th this this whole cast like like this whole episode especially 
we we've shown that we can take this deeply seriously without like abandoning what the this film actually is there's yes. enough to talk about there, there, there's there's enough to take seriously and and like th- this type of theory comes back a lot in children's media like you know oh ash ketchum went in a coma when lightning struck him and yeah. that's why he's always 10 years old fuck you <laughs> and to just to really debunk the theory studio ghibli like reportedly uh, replied with everyone do not worry there's absolutely no truth to the theory that totoro is the god of death or that may is dead in the my neighbor totoro the actual explanation for the lack of shadow is more mundane the animators simply didn't deem shadows necessary for the scene in question all right in that case uh <laughs> yeah okay so first of all uh, we have to like address like death of the author but like also death of all the idiots who came up with that theory i think death yeah. of the author yeah. is more topical with grave of the fireflies oh yeah definitely which again we'll get to next time but uh so yeah you could have talked a little less about the god of death because one of the things is like totoro spent a decade in production i think because originally was supposed to be only one girl, which you can see on that movie poster we already talked about. There's only one girl in Satsuki's dress. She doesn't yeah, but, have But with May's hair. haircut. Yeah. And he proposed that movie to a Tokyo movie, Shinsha, where he stopped working in the early 80s. Like, his last work with them was the oh. 1985 episode run or something of Sherlock Hound. So this is a long time ago. Oh, so this is like a, a long, like before uh, he founded Ghibli, it was like a, a, a passion project of his. Long before. He proposed it to them, they wanted to make a TV special, but nothing really came of it because he also hadn't written the story because he had to introduce the second girl for some reason. I think it was something they didn't want to start with, just one little girl. Something like that. And in the end, it morphed to this movie that we got now. Maybe that's also why it was just a side project, because it was already from the 70s. It's a leftover. That's a very interesting thing to observe. There's also a lot of notes about that in the when was, Pan, when was Panda Copanda made? 1972. 1972, oh, wow, 1973. That's a long that's time early, ago. Okay. Then, like, Totoro is actually almost as old as that movie then. At least, like, the conception of it. Yes, well, that's probably. Uh, that's really probably interesting. Late, that... eight, late 70s project by Miyazaki. Really ties the whole uh, history together. Okay. Um, and then there's the yeah. father figure. The father. Do you know who voiced the father? No. Igezatu Itoi. Do you know who that is? No. No. He is a copywriter from Japan, essayist, author, all kinds of stuff. And he's the game designer for the Mother series. What? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, that's a really cool bit of trivia. Yes, this guy just voiced the father in this movie. Was already a well-known copywriter and essayist in Japan. Later, he became a game designer for Nintendo. He only did Mother, nothing else. And there's also this little oh. piece of trivia where his website, the almost da- daily Itoi News. The IT manager for it for the longest time was Satoru Iwata from Nintendo, the president himself. That, that that's really cool. That, that that that's that's like learning that uh, Hans Zimmer was the uh, keyboardist in the uh, music video for "Video Kill the Radio Star." That's, oh shit! That's just now the you know that, that too. That's just, that's really strange. Just Shigesato Itoi because he can. I mean, there's other that, cool. Did he like, do here. any? Did he do any other voice acting no, work? No, that's his the only, only thing. He has other credits on Mel because of the manga adaptations of Earthbound. Uh, okay. Okay. I, mean, I think uh, also... here, at the, here at the end, I also wanted to just mention some things that I I, I found really amazing in terms of uh, the animation and direction in this movie, because um, and I think we've mentioned this earlier that. In animation, there are no accidents. Everything is has to be planned and decided. You, well, there you, are you, accidents. There are lots of accidents. Yeah, but, but not like in not, not in the same way that like uh, you, um, you 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 may in live action you you have a few takes and then something unexpected happens in a take and you're like oh let let's do this and that 
Okay, that kind Starbucks of stuff doesn't happen. It's all animation. storyboarded. Yeah, it's all storyboarded and uh, and planned. But uh, but I wanted to like just mention a few things that I I just found really really so great and uh, a great reason to like rewatch this again and again. There's a lot of detail. Um, there's um, when they explore the house, you notice the way both girls walk up the stairs or crawl up the stairs is really like thought through like like it's almost like they measured like how long is each like step of the stairs how tall are they how would they walk up and down this and like like it, it's it's really uh, th- that sort of detail is like in most of the movie and it really grounds the characters you feel like they're really standing there uh in in the setting that's uh when uh, we, we transition from them just having explored the house uh, and and just having learned about the uh, the dust bunnies, the soot sprites, we have this like one or one and a half second clip of the soot sprites in the attic, and there's this little uh, little shrine thing. There's a little artifact that that's put up there, probably some sort of superstition, and we never see it again. And and there was no real reason for us to show, for us to be shown that. But it's there, and it, and I find it amazing. Uh, there's there's these little um, these little Ghibli details of character action and movement uh, all over the place. One that I notice is um, when the father uh, goes along with May to uh, try to find Totoro again. Uh, the way he uses his sandals. Like he takes them off at one point, puts them on his hands when he's crawling, uh, puts them back on when they're done, and like they didn't have to do that, but they they did. Yeah, of course uh, they did. It's Miyazaki. He uh, will be the perfectionist uh, to the end. Yeah, of course. And and a c- couple of other things: fresh vegetables. Holy shit! The vegetables when they they're with the granny and the uh, they have the basket, and it looks amazing and it's there for like again like a half second clip of the this amazing basket of fresh vegetables that's the shit um, and then they eat them and then they eat them and it's good and finally they the, eat the vegetables <laughs> they eat fresh vegetables the and fresh vegetables yeah so they're fresh and they're good and they will cure your illness um and they soaked in the pure water of the stream they're blessed by the forest gods uh, and f- and finally there was this uh, these two shots that i think are like the probably like the best shots in the movie that aren't like really like sakuga animation so after they learn that the mother is sick again and may like had this tantrum and they had to like go home there are two shots we see uh, Satsuki lying in one room, just an empty room, and, and like lying down really sad, like really small in the frame. And then we cut to a similar shot in another room uh, with Mei lying there, and there's toys all around her, and, a, and an empty glass of water. It tells the entire story of what, like, what went on when they got home. Of Mei, like, she had a tantrum, she was really sad. She, she got a lot of things to play with. She made a mess. She got a glass of water and she fell asleep. All of that in like, like uh, two similar, two oh, mirrored yes. shots. It's great. I love this. This is an movie. amazing. This is an amazing scene that also Miyazaki talked about this explicitly because this was one he was wrecking his brain about. He he was thinking about okay, what would happen? What would happen? She wouldn't just fall asleep. Of course she wouldn't. Like, oh, what would she do? Uh, and he was thinking of, of course, and he, he he said, while figuring out what May would do, I learned what I probably did as a child, like, play, b- distract yourself, and then just suddenly, while playing, fall asleep. And he talked about, like, this as a revelation to him, like, this is the moment the character came into, like, into, like, uh, coherence, this is the moment he learned about his own childhood, this is the moment he learned to understand children, like, this is the way he framed it, this is the one he, like, really thought about extensively, and it's great that you, like, noticed this detail. And it's like, and again, it's like a couple of seconds, and I I think that's really what makes Miyazaki and makes uh, Ghibli so special, is that not only attention to detail, but attention to character, to people, uh, and and just this 
this generosity to, to towards uh, the audience and to the characters within the the work that they, they're given this life these little movements and th- these like real things that they do and experience that just really ma- makes it all feel so much more alive than most other uh, animation ever could be i think that's like that that's why they they're so rewarding even on rewatch yeah, one thing that struck me while looking at some of the animation, one of the main animators of this is Makiko Fujaki, who is famously one of the few female animators who have gotten a lot of fame in the early years. She worked in Akira and everything. She has a lot of shots in this movie, which is a movie that features character acting and two little girls. I think he very consciously chose her. She does a lot of great scenes, like the two little Totoros running away from May. That's all her. That like 45 second sequence. Well, the that's scene amazing. of the plants growing, where they, where they summon the plants and make them grow into a giant tree. That's her. Okay, she's amazing then. I mean, I think she did the main scene of Tetsuo expanding in Akira. So yeah. Oh shit. Holy she's God. pretty great. Damn. I guess, like, I can see the similarities between that and, like, the tree growling kind yeah, of. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the way, the, like... The same kind combines. of everything comes into existence from Same here. energy. <laughs> Nothing into everything. Yeah. I, th- I think, uh... I think that's about it. I think that's about it. I think we're summed up. I, th- I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Nausicast, and I hope you're satisfied with our readings of uh, Totoro. Stay tuned for some more in the next episode when we're going to talk about Grave of the Fireflies and I'm going to take a moment to expand on like the comparisons to Totoro within the scope of the movie. But also, stay tuned for that in general because, you know, great movie and we'll see many familiar faces again talking about it. Before you leave, maybe consider dropping us a buck on our Patreon on patreon.com slash with two A's and otherwise, have a nice day. One last thing, if you see any faces, oh. please check your monitor. There shouldn't be any faces on the screen. <laughs> Good night, okay, everybody. Okay. Good night. <laughs>